over a thousand rhinos, over 30,000 elephants each year are being killed for their valuable body parts. Over $23 billion is the global revenue of illegal wildlife crime trade. But these are big numbers. They don't really mean anything for us anymore. They've kind of made us really insensitive to this subject. So I want to show you a short fragment from Racing Extinction. And if you don't really want to see it, you can just close your eyes. That was the OO bird, the last male of its species singing for a female that would never come. When we lost that animal, we lost a unique perspective to this world. Extinction is forever. And when I realized that, I knew to myself that I wanted to protect biodiversity. But so often we say to each other or to ourselves, I can't really make a difference. I've tried something, I failed, I quit. But what if there are people that don't say these things? What happens then? In Antarctica, the waters around Antarctica, there are an established whale sanctuary. But each year, this ship sails out. And it's a Japanese ship, and it goes down there to hunt whales under so-called scientific research. But what it does is illegally killing the whales there, cutting them up in pieces immediately, freeze them in, and ship them back to Tokyo and sell them on the market. It's illegal, and the whole world was looking and not doing anything, except for one little group. This little group. A group of eco-vigilantes. They went out there each year on a ship, to stop them. And these people came from all over the world. They're volunteers. You had doctors, you had mechanics, you had hardcore animal rights activists and former policemen. And when I saw this, I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to join these guys. But I had a job similar to you, most of you guys, an office job at that time. I was a, a police crime investigator, but I couldn't make the difference that I wanted to make. So I, you know, at some point, I had to take the leap of faith. Gave up my job, sold my belongings, and I went to Australia, joined, joined the vessel. But there was one thing, I'd never been on the ocean before. And all of a sudden, I had to cross the Southern Ocean. And my only sea experience was a small ferry, uh, ferry that I took from the Netherlands to England. But I wanted it so badly, and yeah, on one of my first trips, they assigned me to the small boats. Now here, there are many challenges in Antarctica, and this is just one of them, as you can see here. This was our first action, we went out on the small boats. And with dead calm water, we went after the harpoon ship, and rapidly, the weather changed so badly that it became really, really difficult to even come back to our own vessel. But we found those harpoon vessels, and here you can see how we arrest them. We went after them, and we used all different kind of tactics to stop them. As you can see here, we used the prop fouling line that we pulled in front of their bow, hoping it would get into their propeller and, and damage their props so they con con couldn't continue their whaling operations. And we succeeded. Each year we were able to reduce their quota. They wanted to catch over 900 whales. Each year we knew that we saved about a few hundred of them because they went back to Tokyo and they said, these guys from Sea Shepherd, they've damaged our operations. And we were very happy that we achieved it. But it wasn't enough for us, of course, because we wanted to completely stop them. So we had to come up with something new. this vessel, and it might remind you of something. It definitely did remind me the Japanese press of something. They called it the Batmobile was coming after the whalers. <laughs> and it was, because it was twice as fast as the harpoon vessel, so we could finally intercept them. And they asked me to become first mate on this vessel, and I thought, wow, this is going to be one hell of an adventure. Not only had there never been um, a trimaran to Antarctica, so that first part of the campaign was already a big risk. But then knowing that we could finally intercept the whalers, yeah, it was something I didn't want to miss out on. And then you have to reach Antarctica. Now, as you can see here, the guy in the middle is not so lucky. We call it the zero gravity spot. That means every time we went through high waves 
and the ship was pitching, this guy would fly up in the air, float around like an astronaut for a few moments, and then collapse back on the ground. And uh, we rotated, every one of us rotated, so we, we could change uh, spots on the vessel. But it was a bit of an adventure reaching Antarctica. But then you get to the South Pole, you get to the water, and then you find this vessel. And we arrested for days on, and we were able to stop it. It could not hunt any more whales. And it was dead in the water. We called in our other ships. And they were going after it, and we said, OK, we're going to head north, we're going to refuel. But we forgot about one thing. ran over us. They hit it? And the guy is asking, did they hit it? Well, here you can yeah. see a bit of the evidence, I guess. And they did hit it, and our ship sunk in the Antarctic. And it felt to us like we failed our mission. We found that big factory ship, but we lost our vessel. Was it all worth for nothing? No, it wasn't. Because this incident was shown all over the world and it became a big news item. And it forced the Australian government and the New Zealand government to act. And they took Japan to court, to the International Court of Justice here in Den Haag. And in 2014, the judge ruled and finally declared the current operations of Japan in Antarctica illegal. And in 2014, for the first time ever, there was no whaling in the Antarctic, all achieved by a small group of dedicated people trying to make a difference. When we accomplished this, I was so intrigued by the capabilities of technology that I started focusing on another topic, because poaching in Africa is skyrocketing. And I thought, how can I make a difference with the technology that I have? And I thought of something that the rangers, they had no capability to look at night to see what's going down a few meters ahead of them, to see whether there are poachers or whether there are So I started introducing drones drones equipped with thermal cameras. There's only one downside when you're starting implementing new technology and you bring it to Africa, and often it's not. <laughs> they crash. And they crash an awful lot. And especially in our first few years that we started. I've seen so many crashes, but we really believed we could make a difference with those tools. We built this wing, this, this Eco Ranger, we called it. Three meter wingspan, could fly for over two hours. We put a lot of our own money in it, actually, almost a, the last bit that we'd left to make this a success. And we took it to a reserve owner in South Africa and said, Yeah, you guys can come and show me uh, what you can manage. So we went down there. The drone took off, beautiful flight. Reserve owner's looking at it, he calls in his fellow rangers, they all start looking at it, live stream video, back to the ground, beautiful. And we're like super excited, and he goes, no, no, I've seen enough, you can land it. And the drone operator goes on his remote control, start nudging, drone doesn't react. Drone starts doing circles above our head, getting closer and closer to the ground. It almost decapitates the rangers that are standing there. And with over 100 kilometers an hour, it crashes into the ground, scattering into a thousand pieces. Our dream blew up right there. Nobody could say a word. I was looking at my co-founder, we're going, we're done, we're done. And this reserve owner, he puts up a small smile. And he says, for us now, famous words. He says, you know what? The Wright brothers? They didn't get it right the first time either. <laughs> and that night, he purchased two of our drones. And that was the beginning for us, for Shed of You. Because a few months later, we managed, for the first time in history, and it was broadcasted 
um, on, on national TV here. We were the first time ever that we intercepted rhino poachers. And it became a success. And ever since, we've been implementing this drone technology all over the world. We went to Borneo, went to Malawi, Kenya, Tanzania. But we started looking further than just drones. We started at, okay, what else, what other technology is out there that can make a difference? Right now, we're creating smart parks in Rwanda with a big uh, foundation called African Parks, where we are building our own network based on, on LoRa. And in that network, we can uh, put all kinds of sensors. And these sensors, we can attach to vehicles, to people, even to animals at a later stage. So we can see exactly what is happening in the reserve. So we can make the work for the rangers and the people that are, other people that are out there safer, better, and more efficient in order to stop poachers. So I hope that this showed you that a small group of people can make a difference. And I hope it showed you that failure does not mean the end. It means you have to try harder, and you have to keep going, because if you believe in your dream, you can make it happen. And you're not the only one trying to make a difference out there. Even here, just in the Netherlands, there are people trying to make a difference. Because if you combine your passion with your skills, you create something that is so unbelievably powerful that not only can you start creating jobs, like Wietse van der Werf is doing in Rotterdam. He's training unemployed youth by former Marines to make them ocean protectors. Not only can you change legislation, like Mariana Thieme is doing with the Party for Animals, and not only can you clean up the oceans like Bojan Slot is doing with the ocean cleanup. But you can create a world where there is no bird that has to sing a final song. You can create a world where we all can live peacefully with the beautiful animals that we share this planet with. Thank you.